Meeting is called to order. Thank you for coming to the February ACIP meeting 2019. Good morning and welcome. The proceedings of this meeting are accessible to people not in attendance via the World Wide Web. Welcome to those who are not attending ACIP in person but are watching us. There are multiple CDC staff at the entrance of the rooms to help guide you. There's also a desk in the lobby to assist members of the public with questions. Handouts of the slides to be presented have been distributed to ACIP members and are available for members of the public on the table outside the auditorium. Additionally, slides are available to, through the share file link for members, for liaison and ex officio members. Slides presented at this meeting will be posted on the ACIP website approximately three to four weeks after the meeting. The live webcast videos will also be posted in about four weeks, and meeting minutes are posted to the ACIP website, generally within about 120 days of the meeting. Minutes from the October 2018 meeting will be posted shortly after this meeting. I do wanna go over a little bit of safety information prior uh, to the meeting getting started to ensure the health and safety of all the individuals attending this meeting. Um, in the event of an emergency resulting in evacuation, the procedures are as follows. For people sitting in the back of the room behind the, uh, behind the ropes, please exit out the rear doors and across the bridge the same way you came in. Um, for people who are in the front of the room, please exit through the rear of these rooms, through these two exit doors, and um, turn to the left and then go down the stairs. Locate the blue building marker sign labeled conference and meeting center space and group together to ensure all the attendees are accounted for. Once the premises have been secured and an all clear has been issued, you may re-enter the building and we'll restart the meeting. At this meeting, coffee and drinks will be served in the lobby in the morning, uh, followed by uh, Chick-fil-A will be selling sandwiches out in the lobby during the lunch hour. If you do leave the building during lunch, please anticipate potential security lines as you come back in, and we will start the meeting promptly after the lunch period. The next ACIP meeting will be convened at CDC on Wednesday and Thursday, June 27th and 8th, 2019. Regist 26th and 27th, 2019. Registration for all meeting attendees is required and will be open on the ACIP website shortly. Uh, registration is not required for webcast viewing. We do have a couple of member substitutions for this meeting. Uh, Susan Lett will be representing both AIM and CSTE at this meeting. Um, and uh, Lori Hoffman Hogg will be representing the VA at this meeting. Um, I also want to introduce one new um, liaison member. Uh, Dr. Linda Eckert uh, is going to be our new ACOG uh, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology member. We're now going to introduce the four new ACIP members and our incoming chair, Dr. Jose Romero. Um, Dr. Romero was an ACIP member from 2014 to 2018. Uh, he's a pediatrician and pediatric infectious disease specialist at University of Arkansas. He brings extensive administration, vaccine policy, clinical teaching, and research perspective to the ACIP. And as, as you all know, he has done a remarkable job over the years leading several uh, ACIP uh, work groups as chair, um, and we look forward to having him uh, take on this role for the next three years. Thank you. Um, this is uh, a unique honor, and uh, I'm uh, very grateful to have this position, and uh, we'll introduce now uh, the four new members of the group. So um, first, uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Kevin Alt, who is a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the uh, University of Kansas School of Medicine. Um, he uh, was the liaison representative to the ACIP from the American College of Obstet Obstetricians and Gynecologists from 2013 to present. He's currently a member of the ACIP's uh, influenza work group. Welcome, Dr. Um, next is uh, Dr. Stefan Gravenstein. Um, he is uh, an academic and general geriatrician at the Brown University School of Medicine and School of Public Health. Um, he has extensive uh, research in immunizations uh, across the lifespan uh, with special focus on immunization issues in the older uh, adults. Welcome, Dr. Raventhin. Next is Ms. Uh, Veronica McNally. 
Uh, she is our new consumer representative to the ACIP. She's the president and CEO of the Franny Strong Foundation. This was established, this foundation was established in memory of her infant daughter and promotes vaccinations and education about vaccines and vaccinations. Welcome, Ms. McAllen. Last but not least, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Uh, Kip Talbot, uh, an internist and infectious diseases specialist from Vanderbilt University. She too has extensive experience in immunizations <coughs> across all aspects, all, all lifespan, and has a special focus uh, on immunizations in older individuals. She's currently a member of the ACIP pneumococcal workgroup. Welcome, Dr. Talbot. Our guest at Tendiz uh, today uh, are uh, Dr. Alejandro uh, Craviota, uh, chair of the World Health Organization Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization uh, stage, and of course, uh, and uh, Dr. John Abramson, who's the chair of Gavi Vaccine Investment Strategy Screening Group. Welcome. As stated in the ACIP charter, the purpose of the ACIP meeting is to deliberate on the use of vaccines to control disease in the U.S., including considerations of disease epidemiology and burden of disease, vaccine efficacy and effectiveness, vaccine safety, the quality of the evidence reviewed, economic analyses, and implementation issues. The committee may revise or withdraw their recommendations regarding a particular vaccine as new information on disease epidemiology, vaccine effectiveness, or safety, economic consideration, or other data become available. Under the provisions of the uh, Affordable Care Act, immunization recommendations of the committee that have been adopted by the director of CDC must be covered by the applicable health plans. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices is at its heart a public body. Engagement with the public and transparency in our processes is vital to the committee's work. As part of ACIP's commitment to continuous improvement, this meeting features changes to strengthen our oral and written public comment process. These changes are designed to accommodate increased public interest in ACIP's work, maximize opportunities for comment, make public comment more transparent and efficient, and create a fair process for assigning limited oral public, health, public comment time. I want to take a couple of minutes to outline these changes for this meeting and as always, we are dedicated to continuous improvement and welcome feedback on ways we continue, can continue to strengthen ACIP's processes and maximize engagement with the public. First, I want to address changes to ACIP's oral public process. In previous meetings, we would hold multiple short public comment periods over the course of the meeting's two days, and people would sign up for public comment on site at the day of the meeting. With increased public interest in commenting at ACIP meetings, we wanted to improve this process so we could provide more time for public comment, make the process for signing up for comment more efficient, and create a fair way to determine public speakers when there were more people requesting to speak than we could accommodate at the meeting's limited time. So for this meeting, we've made the following improvements to our process. Rather than having multiple shorter periods across the two days, we now have a single 75-minute public comment period at the end of the first day of the meeting and before any scheduled votes. This change reserves more time for public comment than we've had at previous meetings and allows speakers to hear all the presentations related to the ACIP vote before their comments. We have a clearer registration process. To create a fairer and more efficient process for requesting to make an oral comment, we now ask that people interested in making an oral comment submit a request online in advance of the meeting. Priority is given to these advanced requests. If more people request to speak than can be accommodated, we conduct a blind lottery to determine who the speakers will be. Speakers selected in the lottery are notified in advance of the meeting. For today's public comment speakers, please make sure you sign in with Noah Alshire, who is at the back uh, of the room right now, before the public comment period at the end of the day, so we know you're here. Some of the processes from the previous public comment uh, process have been maintained. As with previous comment periods, speakers will be limited to three minutes to make their comments. It is critical that speakers stay within this time to ensure that all public commenters have the opportunity to speak. We will have a timer at this meeting so speakers will know when their time has expired. 
As with previous meetings, the ACIP has the discretion to recognize individuals to provide scientific and technical input that is relevant to the committee's deliberations at any time during the meeting. This is not an alternative to the public comment process, rather is an opportunity for the committee to obtain relevant scientific and technical information from individual experts and stakeholders to inform its decision. We've also made substantial improvements to the written public comment process. These changes were based on feedback from the public asking for more time and ability to submit more detailed written public comments. Previously, public comments were submitted via email to CDC with length limited to one page and comments required to be submitted days before the meeting. For this and subsequent meetings, we are using a docket on regulations.gov where any member of the public can submit a written document. This is a substantial pr improvement as this new process allows for the ability to submit longer comments and the ability to include attachments. The comments are visible to the public, a longer window for the comment submission, and you can now submit comments up to 48 hours following the end of the meeting, and all comments submitted by 72 hours of the meeting will be made available to the ACIP members prior to the meeting. This is the website that you go to to find the uh, public comment docket. It is still open. The ID number is CDC 2019-2019-0002. You can um, still submit a public comment, um, and we encourage you to read and um, access those public comments during the meeting or after the meeting. Um, this information can also be found in the Federal Register Notice announcing ACIP meetings and on the ACIP meeting website. As noted in the ACIP Policies and Procedures Manual, the ACIP members agree to forego participation in certain activities related to vaccines during their tenure on the committee. For certain other interests that potentially enhance a member's expertise while serving on the committee, CDC has issued limited conflict of interest waivers. Members who conduct vaccine clinical trials or serve on data safety monitoring boards may present on the committee on matters related to those vaccines, but these members are prohibited from participating in committee votes on issues related to these vaccines. Regarding vaccines of the concerned company, a member may participate in the discussion with the provision that he or she abstain from all votes related to vaccines at that, of that company. At the beginning of each, each ACIP meeting during the roll call, ACIP members should state any conflicts of interest. Detailed instructions for ACIP um, names of potential uh, candidates uh, will be added to the ACIP website shortly. We're actually transitioning to an online application um, process, which we hope will make the process more efficient um, and easier for members to apply for nominations. Um, applications will be due no, the, no later than uh, July 1st, 2019 for the four-year term beginning July 2020. Uh, prior to taking roll call, we request that everyone um, turn off their cell phones to avoid disruption, and I will turn it over to Dr. Romero now to um, conduct roll call. Thank you. So I'm going to ask now that the uh, ACIP members, voting members, um, uh, take uh, announce themselves. I will begin. Uh, Jose Romero, no conflicts, and please list any conflicts, and we'll go to my right. Grace Lee, no conflicts. Veronica McNally, no conflicts. Kevin Alt, no conflicts. Peter Salagi, no conflicts. Kip Talbot, no conflicts. Robert Atmar, no conflicts. Hank Bernstein, no conflicts. Ezana Lewin, no conflict. Uh, David Stevens, no conflicts. Kelly Moore, no conflicts. Stephen Graham signed conflicts with uh, Sanofi, Securus, and Merck. <laughs> Paul Hunter, no conflicts. Chip Walter, no conflicts. Sharon Fry, no conflicts. Thank you and welcome. We're going to introduce Dr. Uh, Melinda Wharton, um, and then the ex officio members, as, uh, and then the liaison members will introduce themselves. Um, please include the name of the agency or organization you are representing. Melinda Wharton, Centers for Disease Control. Oh. Tammy Beckham, National Vaccine Program Office. John Bargo, National Institute of uh, Allergy, Infectious Disease, National Institute of Health. 
Norai Nair, HRSA. Doran Fink, Food and Drug Administration. Eric Dusing, Department of Defense. Tom Weiser, Indian Health Service. Lori Hoffman Hogue, representing Dr. Jane Kim, Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, Dr. Amy Middleman, representing the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine. Dr. Patricia Whitley Williams, representing the National Medical Association. Dr. Corey Robertson, representing Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. Patsy Stinchfield, National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners. Carolyn Quash, National Advisory Committee on Immunization in Canada. Matt Zahn, National Association of County and City Health Officials. Bill Schaffner, on behalf of the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases. Carol Baker, Infectious Disease Society of America. Um, Su Susan Litt, representing the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists and um, the Association of Immunization Program Managers. Phyllis Arthur, Biotechnology Innovation Organization, Bio. Dr. Nathaniel Smith, representing the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. Stan Grog, American Osteopathic Asso Association. Steve Foster, American Pharmacists Association. Paul McKinney, Association of Prevention, Teaching and Research. Rebecca Coyle, American Immunization Registry Association. Dr. Linda Eckert, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Dr. Mark Natoski, America's Health Insurance Plans. Sandra Freihofer, American Medical Association. Dr. Jason Goldman, American College of Physicians. Carol Hayes, American College of Nurse Midwives. Susan Even, American College Health Association. Marie Michelle Leger, American Academy of Physician Assistants. David Kimberlin, American Academy of Pediatrics Red Book. Bonnie Maldonado, American Academy of Pediatrics, Committee on Infectious Diseases. Pamela Rockwell, American Academy of Family Physicians. Thank you all. So we'll begin then. <clears throat> Let's um, start with uh, our first uh, topic of the day, which, are, which is Japanese encephalitis virus. Uh, the introduction will be given by Dr. Chip Walter. Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce the first session for the meeting, and the topic for today's first session is Japanese encephalitis vaccine. And I'm presenting on behalf of the work group members, just to acknowledge here my co-member from ACIP, Robert Atmar, our CDC lead, Susan Hills, the ACIP liaisons, ex officio members, and technical advisors. So the objectives of our work group are to review newly available safety and immunogenicity data for the inactivated varicell culture-derived Japanese encephalitis vaccine, abbreviated JEVC. Our other objectives for the work group have been to review the epidemiology and risk of Japanese encephalitis in travelers and to review the current and existing ACIP recommendations for use of Japanese encephalitis vaccine in consideration of the updated data that's been presented to the work group. And finally, to update the MMWR recommendations and reports. Just as a reminder, at the last session, uh, we had a presentation looking at the evidence to recommendation framework for the updated Japanese encephalitis vaccine recommendations. We also at that meeting reviewed the accelerated dosing schedule data in adults, and we also looked at the booster dose recommendations, uh, strengthening the current permissive recommendations, and also the potential for expanding the recommendations to include children uh, less than 17 years of age. So for today's session, uh, Susan Hills is going to come up and present background and review of Japanese encephalitis and Japanese uh, encephalitis vaccine. Uh, then she's going to review, and we will uh, this afternoon vote on updated recommendations for U.S. travelers, the accelerated primary series uh, in adults, and the new potential booster dose recommendations. And then uh, we'll conclude, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, the upcoming uh, publication for the recommendations in the MMWR and next steps for the work group, which will probably be our last uh, session. So. Susan? 
And I'm going to ask everybody to hold their questions until the end of the presentations, um, the booster recommendations. Uh, thank you, Dr. Walter, and good morning, everyone. So I'm going to begin my presentation today with a brief background and review of uh, JE and JE vaccine. JE is caused by a mosquito-borne flavivirus. Uh, it occurs in most of Asia and parts of the Western Pacific and is a leading vaccine preventable cause of encephalitis in Asia. Most JE virus infections are asymptomatic with less than 1% of infected people developing neurologic disease. However, when disease does occur, it's often severe. About 20 to 30% of patients die, and 30 to 50% of survivors have significant neurologic, cognitive, or behavioral sequelae. There's no specific antiviral therapy, and treatment consists of supportive care. Currently, even with national vaccination programs in some countries, uh, there are still an estimated 68,000 JE cases annually in Asia, with an overall incidence for all age groups of approximately 1.8 cases per 100,000 population. The highest risk for infection is in rural agricultural areas because the primary breeding site for the main mosquito vector is rice fields. For most travellers to Asia, the risk of JE is very low, but it varies based on travel destination, duration, season, activities and accommodations. A JE vaccine was first licensed in the United States in 1992. In the 25 years from 1992 through 2017, only 12 JE cases were identified among US travellers or expatriates. Based on these 12 reported JE cases and 4 to 5 million US citizen trips to Asia annually, the estimated risk for travellers is less than one case per million trips to Asia. Travellers with longer trips or increased rural and outdoor exposures are at higher risk of acquiring JE virus infection. Among the 12 US traveller cases, eight had travelled for a month or longer, and three cases travelled for less than a month, but spent at least one night in a rural area. One case travelled for less than one month, but we had no information on their itinerary or activities. JEVC, manufactured by Valneva as Ixiaro, is the only JE vaccine currently licensed and available in the United States. The vaccine was licensed for adults aged 17 years and older in 2009, and the licensure was subsequently extended to children aged two months and older in 2013. The primary series is two doses administered 28 days apart, and ACIP recommendations for a booster dose for adults at least one year after the primary series were approved in 2011. I will discuss booster doses for children later in today's presentation. There are no efficacy data for Ixiaro, however, there is an established immunologic correlate of protection, which is a JE virus 50% plaque reduction neutralization test titer of 10 or greater. The vaccine was licensed based on a non-inferior neutralizing antibody response compared with a licensed mouse brain derived JE vaccine. Following licensure of JEVC for adults in 2009, ACIP approved recommendations for use of JE vaccine in US travelers. In 2013, uh, following licensure of JEVC for children, a grade analysis was performed and JE vaccine recommendations were uh, reviewed. The recommendations were extended to children, but no other changes to the recommendations were considered necessary. The current review of the JE vaccine recommendations for travellers is a routine review in consideration of new safety, immunogenicity and traveller risk data. As part of this review, the JE vaccine workgroup prepared an updated MMWR recommendations and reports document that incorporates previously published policy notes and new data indications and dosing schedules. 
As Dr. Walter uh, mentioned, ACIP will be asked to vote on three topics in regards to JE vaccine today. The first topic is related to updates to the JE vaccine recommendations for US travellers. The changes from the current JE vaccine recommendations are minor. In summary, they are the inclusion of additional information on the factors that increase JE risk, uh, to help healthcare providers identify travellers who might be at higher risk of JE virus infection based on their planned itinerary, um, and to assist with clinical decision making for who should be vaccinated. Longer term travel is no longer defined as a specific cutoff of one month or longer. Uh, we remove the consideration of vaccination for travellers to an area with an ongoing JE outbreak. And there are minor changes to address questions that were raised about specific words in the current recommendations. We'll be asking our ACIP to vote on these slightly modified JE vaccine recommendations for US travellers. However, the work group felt that the complete information included in the recommendations is essential for providing context. ACIP members have this language in their background materials, but I'd like to uh, review the information now. So the recommendation section begins, JE is a very low risk disease for most US travellers to JE endemic countries. However, some travellers will be at increased risk of infection based on their planned itinerary. Factors that increase the risk of JE virus exposure include longer duration of travel, travel during the JE virus transmission season, spending time in rural areas, participating in extensive outdoor activities, and staying in accommodations without air conditioning, screens, or bed nets. Accompanying the recommendations is a box that provides more information on these five risk factors to assist healthcare providers in advising patients on what factors increase their risk. The first um, two sections of the box are duration and season. I'm not going to read out this information, but it provides an explanation that in terms of duration, the highest incidence of disease occurs in longer term travellers. There's not a specific duration that puts a traveller at risk, but longer term travel increases the likelihood of exposure to infected mosquitoes. And that longer term travel includes cumulative periods in endemic areas. It then describes that JE virus transmission can be seasonal or year round and points providers to resources to assist with understanding this further. The box continues with additional guidance on location, activities and accommodations. The location section outlines the settings where highest risk occurs and other potential concerns related to the location of travel. The activities section discusses the higher risk with outdoor activities and provides examples. And the accommodation section provides more details on accommodations that are likely to increase the risk of mosquito exposure. The recommendation section then continues as uh, shown here. Healthcare providers should assess each traveler's risk for mosquito exposure and JE virus infection based on their planned itinerary and discuss ways to reduce their risk. All travellers to JE and endemic countries should be advised to take precautions to avoid mosquito bites to reduce the risk for JE and other vector-borne diseases. These precautions include using insect repellent, permethrin impregnated clothing and bed nets and staying in accommodations with screened or air-conditioned rooms. For some people who might be at increased risk for JE based on travel duration, season, location, activities and accommodations, JE vaccine can further reduce the risk for infection. The decision whether to vaccinate should be individualised and weigh the risks related to the specific itinerary, likelihood of future travel to JE endemic countries, high morbidity and mortality of JE when it occurs, availability of an effective vaccine, possibility but low probability of serious adverse events following vaccination, and travellers' personal perception and tolerance of risk. 
Finally, this slide shows the wording we will ask ACIP members to vote on. However, it's important to consider this language in the broader context of the information I've just presented on the previous slides, which will also appear in the recommendations section of the MMWR document. The wording is, JE vaccine is recommended for persons moving to a JE endemic country to take up residence. Longer term, for example, greater than or equal to one month travellers to JE endemic areas and frequent travellers to JE endemic areas. JE vaccine also should be considered for shorter term, for example, less than one month travellers, with an increased risk of JE based on planned travel duration, season, location, activities and accommodations. Vaccination also should be considered for travellers to endemic areas who are uncertain of specific duration of travel, destinations or activities. JV, JE vaccine is not recommended for travellers with very low risk itineraries, such as shorter term travel limited to urban areas or travel that occurs outside of a well-defined JE virus transmission season. The second topic we'll ask ACIP to vote on today is an accelerated primary series schedule for adults aged 18 to 65 years. These data were presented at the October 2018 meeting, as well as at previous ACIP meetings. Um, however, I'd like to briefly review them before the vote today. The timeline of relevant events for this topic is shown on this slide. In March 2009, FDA approved JEVC for use as a two-dose primary series administered in the standard schedule of 0 and 28 days. In October 2015, the manufacturer presented data to ACIP for an alternate accelerated primary series at 0 and 7 days in adults. In December 2017, the manufacturer submitted the BLA amendment to FDA and in October 2018, FDA approved the accelerated primary series and the workgroup represented these data to ACIP. The primary data supporting the accelerated schedule came from a randomised trial among adults aged 18 to 65 years. The study was conducted at seven study sites in Europe. JEVC was administered with rabies vaccine in an accelerated or conventional schedule, a non-inferiority of the accelerated zero and seven day schedule compared with the zero and 28 day conventional schedule were assessed. Some additional data on a shorter primary series schedule came from a previous phase two study in adults. In this trial, JEVC was administered on a zero, 14 and 28 day schedule or a zero and 28 day schedule. For participants randomly assigned to the group that received the zero, 14 and 28 day schedule, blood was collected from participants prior to their third vaccination on day 28, meaning we have data at 14 days after a zero and 14 day schedule. This slide shows the results from the primary study supporting the accelerated schedule. At 28 days after the second dose, among subjects who received the zero and seven day schedule, 99% were seroprotected compared with 100% seroprotected after two doses administered 28 days apart. The geometric mean titer in the accelerated schedule group was higher than in the conventional schedule group. At one year after the second JEVC dose, 94% of subjects who received the two doses seven days apart and 86% of those who received the two doses 28 days apart were seroprotected and the geometric mean titer remained higher in the accelerated schedule group. The additional data from the second study are shown on this slide. Among uh, subjects who received two JEVC doses on day 0 and 14, 96% of subjects were seroprotected at 14 days after the second dose, and the GMT was 328. This was almost the same as the seroprotection rate and GMT in the subjects who received the two doses on day 0 and 28. The dose of JEVC varies by age group and the accelerated primary series schedule data is only approved for adults aged 18 to 65 years. 
So the doses and primary vaccination schedule by age group are as follows. For children aged 2 through 35 months, two 0.25 mil doses are administered on day 0 and 28. For children aged 3 through 17 years, two 0.5 mil doses are administered on day 0 and 28. For adults aged 18 through 65 years, the dose remains 0.5 mils, but the second primary series dose can be administered from uh, 7 to 28 days after the first dose. Finally, for adults older than 65 years, the two 0.5 mil doses are administered on day 0 and 28. The vote today is for the proposed new recommendation for an accelerated schedule in adults aged 18 to 65 years, and the wording is shown on this slide. In adults aged 18 through 65 years, the primary vaccination schedule is two doses administered on day 0 and 7 to 28. The final topic for a vote today is an updated recommendation for a JEVC booster dose. As a reminder, in September 2010, FDA approved a JEVC booster dose for adults aged 17 years and older, and ACIP subsequently approved a booster dose recommendation for adults. In February 2016, the manufacturer presented data to ACIP for a booster dose in children. In June 2017, the manufacturer submitted to FDA a BLA amendment for a paediatric booster dose. In April 2018, FDA approved the paediatric booster dose. And in October 2018, the workgroup represented relevant booster dose data to ACIP. The current ACIP recommendation for a JEVC booster dose for adults aged 17 years and older is shown here. If the primary series of JEVC was administered more than one year previously, a booster dose may be given before potential JE virus exposure. The topics for consideration in regards to changes to the recommendation are to lower the recommended age for a booster dose to include children and to strengthen the current permissive dose recommendation. The supporting data for each topic were presented to ACIP at previous meetings and draft updated recommendations were presented in October 2018, um, but I will briefly review the data prior to today's vote. For the paediatric booster dose recommendation, the supporting data come from one open label randomised trial conducted among children aged 14 months through 17 years. The study was conducted in the Philippines, which is a JE endemic country. It included uh, 300 children randomised to receive or not receive a booster dose of JEVC. And for the 150 randomised to receive the booster dose, it was administered at 11 months after the second dose of the two-dose primary JEVC series. Among these children who received the booster dose, 100% were seroprotected at 28 days after the booster dose, with a geometric mean titer over 2,000. And at two years after the booster, all remained seroprotected and GMT was 350. The workgroup concluded that the current booster dose recommendation for adults should be modified to include children. Next, I will briefly review the data that supports strengthening the current booster dose recommendation. As shown previously, the current permissive uh, recommendation states that if the primary series was administered more than one year previously, a booster dose may be given before potential JE virus exposure. In the three studies that were the basis for, the, for this recommendation, at 12 to 15 months after the two-dose JEVC primary series, 58 to 83 per cent of subjects remain seroprotected. These studies were conducted in Europe, where tick-borne encephalitis vaccine is available. 
Tick-borne encephalitis virus, or TBE virus, is a flavivirus related to JE virus, and there was concern that there might have been a boosting effect of TBE vaccine, which could explain some of the variability in these study results. As a result, the manufacturer conducted a post hoc analysis that stratified subjects by TBE vaccination status. That analysis showed that if subjects had received TBE vaccine before or after JEVC, seroprotection rates over the following five years ranged from 92% at one year to 86% at five years. But if subjects had not received TBE vaccine, seroprotection rates were lower, ranging from 75% at one year down to 64% at five years. In the group who had received TBE vaccine, geometric mean titers were also higher at each time point. The work group concluded that after a two-dose primary series, long-term JE zero protection rates are lower in those not administered TBE vaccine compared with those administered TBE vaccine. TBE vaccine is not available in the United States and other flavivirus vaccines, such as yellow fever uh, vaccine, are not routinely administered with JEVC. Therefore, among US travelers, duration of protection following a booster dose of JEC, JEVC is likely to be most similar to the subjects not administered TBE vaccine, who had lower zero protection rates through five years. Based on these data, the work group recommended the permissive booster dose recommendation should be strengthened from may be given to should be given. In summary, the final vote for an updated recommendation for a JEVC booster dose will apply to both children and adults and will read as follows. A booster dose, i.e. third dose, should be given at greater than or equal to one year after completion of the primary JEVC series if ongoing exposure or re-exposure to JE virus is expected. Before I conclude, I'd just like to outline next steps for the JE vaccine work group. The draft MMWR recommendations and reports on JE vaccine for US travellers was circulated to ACIP members prior to this meeting, and we expect to be able to finalise and move to publication of the document after this meeting. With the topics addressed in the votes today and the publication of the MMWR, the objectives for the JE vaccine work group will all have been addressed and all activities completed, and we expect to discontinue the JE vaccine work group meetings. Thank you. Since there is going to be a vote this afternoon, um, perhaps uh, John Allen from uh, uh, Valnero would like to offer. Sorry, Valneva. Valneva, excuse me, uh, would like to offer some comment. No comment. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, the uh, the topics are open for questions or comments. Hank, Dr. Bernstein. Sorry. Yes. Um, so this is for a, a single booster. Is there any data for multiple boosters over time? After, in, in the adult data, after a single booster, we have um, uh, seroprotection data through six years, which shows 96% um, protection still at six years. There's no additional data beyond that, so there's no additional uh, recommendation for additional booster doses. Yeah, one, con one consideration is to mention the for the vote that this is for both children and adults because the recommendations over time have changed, just as a clarification. Okay. Very good. Dr. Hunter. I'm assuming that these recommendation for the booster does not decrease the amount of vaccine available in the to resident, permanent residents of the high-risk areas because it's going to be a really small amount of vaccine that's used. Okay. 
the um, that and that's correct. Um, one of the main reasons is that um, the vaccine that is licensed in the U.S. is actually not used in the national immunisation programs in endemic countries. There are uh, additional vaccines. There's a live attenuated vaccine that is produced in China that is used most extensively in JE endemic countries. There's also a chimeric vaccine, again not licensed in the U.S. but available uh, in endemic countries. Uh, so JVC is licensed in some of the endemic countries and might be used in the private sector but is not used in the very large uh, national uh, immunisation program so there will be no impact there. Any comments from the liaison group members? Okay, apparently not. So do you want to explain that? So uh, prior to anybody uh, potentially proposing um, making a motion for a vote, I just want to explain the process. So um, for any votes that's taken today, um, when the committee feels ready, they'll make a motion for a vote to approve the recommendations or whatever motion you choose to make. That motion will be seconded. There'll be any additional discussion from among the committee members. And at that point, when that discussion is complete, we'll stay the vote and we'll wait until after the public comment period where we'll come back at the end of the day and actually take the votes. So if there are any other questions, does anybody want to pose a motion? I would propose a motion that we vote on this topic. Dr. Fry, first. Second. Second by Dr. Uh, Ed Marshall, sorry. Okay. Can, can I just also make a comment that we also received some written feedback, I mean, that was circulated to the committee uh, on this topic from, uh, from a group interested in travel medicine. Yes, and I believe that those comments have been posted to the uh, website, uh, to the regulations.gov for public comment. Dr. Walter. One point of clarification, since we're taking three votes, do we need three different motions for three votes? Uh, uh, yes, since we're taking three separate votes, why don't we go through, do you, have the, do you want to go back through each individual vote and we'll do a motion and a second for each vote? That's the first uh, vote there. So, so the first, sorry. Yeah, so let's restart the motion and that this is the first um, vote that's being considered. So let me read that first motion, which is JE vaccine is recommended for persons moving to a JE endemic country to take up residence longer term, an example greater than one month travelers to JE endemic areas and frequent travelers to JE endemic areas. That's the first motion. No, that's the whole thing. That's the whole thing? Sorry. No, the whole thing is the first motion. Okay, you don't keep going. So JE vaccines should also, uh, also should be considered for shorter term uh, example, less than one month travelers, uh, less than one month travelers with an increased risk of JE based uh, on, tra on planned travel duration, season, location, activities, and accommodations. Vaccination also should be considered for travelers to endemic areas who are uncertain of specific duration of travel destinations or activities. JE vaccine is not recommended for travelers with very low risk itineraries, such as short-term travel limited to urban areas or travel that occurs outside of a well-defined JE virus transmission season. First motion. I propose that we vote on the proposed JE vaccine recommendations as just stated. Do we have a second? Dr. Atmar. Second. Second. Great. Any discussion on that vote prior to moving on to considering the second vote? Great. Susan, do you want to put the language up for the second vote? Oh, question by Dr. Hunter. Um, I just want to make sure this is basically simplifying the previous language. Okay, I just want to make sure I understood that. Yes, there's some slight um, modifications, some simplifications, and additional uh, explanations to help uh, clinicians with their decision making. Second motion. 
So this is uh, uh, motion number two. Uh, in adults uh, aged 18 to 65 years of age, the primary vaccination schedule is two doses administered on days zero and seven through 28. Do I have a motion? Dr. Walters? I'd like to make a motion that we uh, vote on the uh, vaccination schedule as stated okay. for those 18 to 65. Do I have a second? Second. Dr. Moore? I second that motion. Okay. Can we have the third? Any discussion prior to oh, moving to the third vote? Motion. Um, just a general third. comment. I think it would be great to have additional information um, going forward, if it's possible, and um, sort of post-recommendation safety surveillance with the accelerated schedule, particularly. Oh, this does not apply to children. This is only in adults. But it, if that information were available, it's a challenge given the low number of doses given. I think that could just sort of add to the benefit risk balance over time. Thank you. And then we'll our third motion. A booster dose example, a third dose, should be given at greater than or equal to one year of, after completion of the primary JEVC series if ongoing exposure or re-exposure to JE virus is expected. Can I have a motion? Kelly, Dr. Moore. Uh, I move that we uh, vote to accept uh, this proposed recommendation for the boost, JEVC booster dose. Do I have a second? Uh, Dr. Walter? I second the motion. Any, any discussion? Dr. Sly? Yeah, again, I, I suggest that we add uh, for children and adults something about the age group because it differs from the other recommendation. So noted. Any other comments from the group, from the voting group? Any comments or questions from the liaisons? So just so I can clarify, I would like to add the wording children and adults into the wording for the recommendation. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Any further discussion? Great. So that concludes the session. We will stay these three uh, 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 motions that are on the table um, and have been seconded. And we will um, take a short break.